This type of compensation plan is most often used when the industry you operate within prohibits direct sales, when salespeople work as part of small groups or teams and all contributions are equal, when your sales team is relatively small, or when your salespeople are expected to spend much of their time on other responsibilities other than selling. However, these plans don't tend to offer motivation to salespeople, as there are no incentives for them to work harder. Salary plus commission sales compensation plans are possibly the most common plans used today. They're structured in a way that salespeople receive a lower base salary along with commission pay that makes up the majority of the total compensation. Organizations use salary plus commission sales compensation plans when there are opportunities to support all salespeople on this structure and when there are proper metrics in place for tracking sales to ensure that the splits are fair and accurate. Okay. So this is the this is the big benefit of a universal philosophy. It says it applies to everybody. Well, looks that doesn't, you know, 205 or 206 countries in the world. And you've got something that applies to everybody. That's a bit strange, isn't it? No, says liberal theory. There are same value structures that apply to all of us. You couldn't have the United Nations without it. It couldn't tell you that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without this idea of values that apply to all of us just because we are humans. Now, the idea is to test that as well. Why is sport universal? Why does everybody play football? It's because the values are specified at a very thin level at the top. There are these rules, and we all have to abide by just these rules. But there are lots of things about football that aren't rules specified. So Brazilian football is different from Italian football, from British football, from German football, from Spanish football. It's culturally specific, but acknowledges that there are these universal general rules to apply to everybody. This type of compensation plan is most often used when the industry you operate within prohibits direct sales, when salespeople work as part of small groups or teams and all contributions are equal, when your sales team is relatively small, or when your salespeople are expected to spend much of their time on other responsibilities other than selling. However, these plans don't tend to offer motivation to salespeople, as there are no incentives for them to work harder. Salary plus commission sales compensation plans are possibly the most common plans used today. 
They're structured in a way that salespeople receive a lower base salary along with commission pay that makes up the majority of the total compensation. Organizations use salary plus commission sales compensation plans when there are opportunities to support all salespeople on this structure and when there are proper metrics in place for tracking sales to ensure that the splits are fair and accurate. Today, I want to talk about an important aspect of education, which is the education expenditure of the UK, compared with other European countries. Based on a recent paper published in The Economist Journal, UK has only spent 1% of its total GDP on tertiary education, which was insufficient as compared with other European countries such as Finland and Denmark. For instance, the expenditure of Spain is close to the UK in some cases in 2007, and this survey conducted among 50 major cities around the country. However, Denmark and Finland spent much more than the other European countries. So, if we decide to compare the education expenditure of the UK with various developing countries, we will find mind-boggling figures in this regard compared to the other countries. We can ask two fundamental questions about animal behavior they referred to as proximate and ultimate. Proximate questions are those concerned with the mechanisms that bring about behavior. Ultimate questions are those concerned with the evolution of behavior. We can divide the proximate and ultimate into two sub-questions. For proximate, how does behavior develop and secondly, what causes the behavior? For ultimate, you can ask how did the behavior evolve and secondly, what is the adaptive of significance of the behavior? What's its purpose? Together, these comprise what are called Timbergen's four questions about animal behavior. Nico Timbergen was one of the founding fathers of the study of the animal behaviors. These questions represent different ways of studying animal behavior and understanding the difference between those four questions are fundamental to understanding behavior and indeed the whole of biology. How do we study animal behavior? Well, that depends on the type of question we're hoping to answer.
determinant, human behavior is affected by internal and external factors. At the end of lecture, the speaker mentioned that psychologists are interested in explaining human behavior. Determinant is influenced by two factors, the personal factors, which are internal, and the environmental factors, which are external. The personal factors include people's belief on certain things and their individual thinking about it, while the environmental factors include temperature, air pressure, and the others thinking about them. In conclusion, one's determinants are affected by both himself and the environment. This is a chest x-ray that would be taken in your doctor's office, for example, or a radiologist's office. And it is a good example of biomedical engineering and that it takes a physical principle, that is how x-rays interact with the tissues of your body, and it uses that physics, that physical principle to develop a picture of what's inside your body, so to look inside and see things that you couldn't see without this device. And you'll recognize some parts of the image, you can see the ribcage here. The bones you can see the heart is the large bright object down here if you have good eyesight from the distance, you can see the vessels leading out of the heart and into the lungs, and the lungs are darker spaces within the ribcage. We usually see blogging as a two-way interaction, in which the blogger creates the content, and the readers interact or challenge the author. But the case will be much difficult when it comes to government, such as the White House. Because people will become coarser and write online, especially in the comment area. Hence the governor blog may go wild and chaotic. So the government will have to administrate the comment. Once the government starts administrating the comment, Citizens may find the government manipulating what should be said and what should be shown, which contradicts the original intention.
Actually, a woman in the class I'm teaching at Sydney at the moment, a career woman, expressed this very nicely, although she was talking about something else, she was distinguishing expertise from authority. And certainly linguists, because of our training, we do have expertise in certain very narrow areas of language, but we don't have the authority over what to do with that knowledge or what to do with other knowledge that the community produces. I guess for me the bottom line is languages are lost because of the dominance of one people over another. That's not rocket science. It's not hard to work that out. But then what that means is if in working with language revival we continue to hold the authority, we actually haven't done anything towards undoing how languages are lost in the first place, so in a sense the languages are still lost if the authority is still lost. I understand your professor has been discussing several Eastern Woodland Indian tribes in your study of Native American cultures. As you have probably learned, the Eastern Woodland Indians get their name from the forest-covered areas of the eastern United States where they lived. The earliest woodland cultures date back 9,000 years, but the group will focus on dates back only to about 700 AD. We now call these Native Americans the Mississippian culture, because they settled in the Mississippi River Valley. This civilization is known for its flat-topped monuments, called temple mounds. They were made of earth and used as temples and official residences. The temple mounds were located in the central square of the city, with the huts of the townspeople built in rows around the plaza. The Mississippian people were city dwellers. But some city residents earned their living as farmers, tending the fields of corn, beans, and squash that surrounded the city. The city's artisans made arrowheads, leather goods, pottery, and jewelry. For centuries, boys were top of the class. But these days, that's no longer the case. A new study by the OECD, a club of mostly rich countries, examined how 15-year-old boys and girls performed at reading, mathematics, and science. Boys still score somewhat better at maths, and in science, the genders are roughly equal. But when it comes to the students who really struggle, the difference is stark. Boys are 50% more likely than girls to fall short of basic standards in all three areas. Researchers suggest that doing homework set by teachers is linked to better performance in maths, reading, and science. Boys, it appears, spend more of their free time in the virtual world, 
they are 17% more likely than girls to play collaborative online games than girls every day. They also use the internet more. Third, peer pressure plays a role. A lot of boys decide early on that they are just too cool for school, which means they're more likely to be rowdy in class. Teachers mark them down for this. In anonymous tests, boys perform better. In fact, the gender gap in reading drops by a third when teachers don't know the gender of the pupil they are marking. So what can be done to close this gap? Getting boys to do more homework and cut down on screen time would help. But most of all, abandoning gender stereotypes would benefit all students. Boys in countries with the best schools read much better than girls. And girls in Shanghai excel in mathematics. They outperform boys from anywhere else in the world.